it depends on who the country is. So, for example, most of the world's cobalt comes from Congo. And without cobalt, there are no EVs. And in fact, cell phones, for the large part, go away. Congo is, at best, a failed state. Uh, and so the idea that it has any control over how this goes is a little ludicrous. Right now, the mines are owned primarily by the Chinese. They get the ore out, they send it to China for processing, then it's incorporated into battery chassis uh, in East Asia, and then it goes to the wider world. But if you break that first link, the cobalt, uh, you know, your, your options are limited. Number one, you can come up with a much better battery chemistry, but I'd argue we've been working on that for 10 years with limited success. Uh, number two, you can occupy Congo, which is in essence what the Chinese have done to this point. You can go on neo-colonial. I would like to think that there would be an ethics conversation to be held at that point. Or number three, you can just go without and kiss that aspect of the green of the green transition completely goodbye. Uh, and we're going to have to have some version of this conversation about each and every one of these materials. Most of them are not as physically concentrated in their production like cobalt. For example, iron ore primarily comes from two countries, Australia and Brazil. But to think that all of these changes can cascade through and production and transport of the material and the intermediate products is just going to be unaffected, uh, that's some optimistic thinking. The, the first three books are more or less about the rise and the fall of great powers. So Accidental Superpowers talks about the crises that, America, that are going to erupt because of deglobalization and depopulation and then the issues that Americans are most likely not to notice. Uh, absent superpower goes into depth in the shale revolution and then plays it forward to show how that's going to accelerate the American withdrawal and remake the American industrial space. Disunited Nations is on the backside of deglobalization. It's about how the countries that we think of as the future, your Brazils, your Russias, your Chinas, came to occupy that place in our mind and how in a deglobalized world collapses one of the um, the less dire outcomes for them, and instead presenting the, the country like, like France and Japan that actually will dominate the human conditions in the future. So all of these are about countries rising and falling in these changed circumstances. The newer book does it from a business point of view. So instead of focusing on the rise and fall of China or Argentina or whoever it happened to be, it goes into each of the economic sectors that define our world, transport, finance, energy, industrial commodities, manufacturing, and agriculture. Shows us how we got to this interconnected world and what that meant, how that changed space, how that changed investment opportunities, and then how everything is going to turn inside out as globalization breaks down and depopulation really drives us forward. Uh, it's different lessons for different sectors in different regions. There's a lot of stories to tell, and it's making a bit of a mess in government circles right now. Uh, let's start with the biggest concern. I don't see our narcissism and our political debates as being a geopolitical limiting factor in terms of our power projection or our future power. It absolutely limits what we're willing to consider, but it doesn't actually get to the core of what allows us to be us, for, for better or for, for ill. Uh, so, for example, 20 years ago when 9-11 happened, we were relatively unified as a country. We were coming off to the 90s, which we thought of as a great decade. And despite the back and forth between the Democrats and the Republicans early in the W administration, we were talking about constructive things. Pre-social media, that helped. 9-11 happened. That drove us together even more. And for the next 15 years, the United States, from a foreign policy view, was very active. Now, we can all say whether or not we can debate whether we thought we were active in a productive way. But the point was there wasn't a lot of dissent within the United States about whether we should or should not be active. It's a question of how should we do it? We can't do that right now. Uh, the debates have become so fierce and so petty and so myopic that the United States at the moment cannot have a conversation with itself about foreign policy. And so if it wasn't for Vladimir Putin making his move back in February, we probably would not be part of the global system from a discussion point of view at all. I don't care what the rhetoric of the West says. We just wouldn't have had the bandwidth because we're all absorbed with everything that's happening domestically. Now, in terms of things in the future that could go wrong, let me give you a couple of scenarios. I don't think any of them are a high likelihood, but I think they're the things we should be concerned about. So first, um, short term, we're facing a capital crunch. We're facing an economic transition. We know that we need to double the size of the industrial plant. That can go wrong in two ways. 
number one, the government can get away in the way. And I do have some concerns about the Biden administration. The Biden administration is facing is treating every problem with supply chains and inflation and taxes as if it were purely a demand issue. And that is not the case. Primarily, these are now supply issues. The chains are breaking down, interruptions to energy flows around the world, a decade loss of investment capital across the entire energy space, and a global agricultural system that is so precariously balanced. The way you solve these issues is with investment in new supply. And the Biden administration seems pathologically, almost ideologically opposed to even considering that as an option. Instead, they're taking steps to increase demand, which in a supply chain stressed inflationary environment is guaranteed to make every single problem that he says he wants to fix worse. I normally try not to criticize political leaders until they've done something so monumentally dumb that they can't come back. And I am worried that the Biden administration is approaching my threshold for that very, very quickly. And if we fail to build out the requisite supply systems to fix these issues, we will have high inflation for a lot more than five years. So if this works and we do the build out, that is inflationary too. And we will have inflation of 9 to 15% for five years, but we will be accompanied by near record growth. If we fail to do the build out, we get all of the inflation and none of the growth, and it is not over in five years. So I'm not too concerned because it's just so obvious, but it should be obvious to the White House press corps as well, and it is not longer term. Ruling out for the moment a general nuclear exchange, which I see as exceedingly low. I think the biggest long-term threat we will have is what happens when you do have a series of breakdowns around the world that shattered global manufacturing and energy and transport and agriculture. The world that emerges from that is going to be a chaotic, somewhat Darwinian place. And in that sort of environment, our problem is not someone like the United States electing somebody like Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Our problem is when a significant ethnicity or series of countries elect their version of populists. Now, this is how we get the next Joe Stalin. This is how we get the next Mao Zedong or the next Adolf Hitler or the next Pol Pot. I am very concerned about what happens to a world that deglobalizes and the U.S. just doesn't care. I don't have a fix for you here. The United States gets engaged for one of two reasons. We see opportunity or we get scared. There's opportunity here. There is a way for the United States to remake the global condition, to remake the human condition. We've got the capacity. We've got the reach. We just don't have the bandwidth at home. And if we can rebuild that bandwidth, 